Today on Storm of Blood, we'll be looking at list building with the Blades of Corn Demon Battalion, the Murder Host. If you haven't already seen the video on the Murder Host Battalion, take a look in the video description below or click here. The first question to ask when list building with the Murder Host Battalion is which Murder Host? Since the Murder Host is focused on demons, we really only have two, the Reapers of Vengeance and the Blood Lords. Let's take a look. By taking the Reapers of Vengeance Slaughter Host, we bring in a lot of anti-magic with the Mage Eater Command trait and the mandatory artifact of power, the Skull Shard Mantle. The main draw of the Reapers of Vengeance, however, is that sweet, sweet command ability. Leave none alive. On Demon Heroes, this ability is incredibly easy to do. Just use it on themselves. On other units, however, really depends on the footprint of the unit. Let me show you. Here we have the most common source of Leave Not Alive, a Bloodthirster. I'm using for this example a Wrath of Corn Bloodthirster. He is behind a unit of 20 Bloodletters. The first thing to keep in mind is that Leave Not Alive is used at the start of the combat phase. This means that pre-planning is crucial to getting this to work, as it's not feasible to charge in such a way where the charging unit is not wholly within 8 inches of a demon hero that is the desired source. I recommend having as many demon heroes as possible, especially Karanak, since he is a hero that does not take a leadership battlefield role in pitched battles, which is simply amazing. Anyway, here's an example of what I mean in regards to having difficulty with ranges of Leave None Alive in the combat phase. Here we have the same unit of Blood Letters, but to charge these Blood Reavers. They are just wholly with an 8 of the Wrath of Form Bloodthirster at the start of the combat phase, and he is just outside of 12 for any potential charges which is a pretty common scenario in most games. You don't want to have send him out immediately. You want to have these guys do the, do the legwork first. And of course, Korn has ju judged these Blood Reavers unworthy. So he sends some demons after them. Let's see what they roll, what these Blood Letters roll to charge. Looks like they need a six to make the charge. Let me show you here. They need a six. Reroll to five. Let's have the Bloodthirster spend a command point to have them reroll their charge. That's a cock die. They rolled a ten here. I'll move the models accordingly off camera so I am not physically standing in front of the camera. And here's where the blood letters have ended up after their charge move. Keep in mind that we were just barely within 8 inches at the start of the charge phase of the Wrath of Corn Bloodthirster. Now that we've charged 10 inches, we are easily, even, even with me bumping his base, easily out of holy with an 8. And here is the issue with using big units and trying to get Keep None Alive to work. You have to commit the demon heroes as well which may not be the most tactically sound option available. As with all things Wargaming, what's happening on the table matters mo way more than any theory. So ultimately, you'll have to make that call. By having as many demon heroes as possible, there will be more sources for Leave None Alive, and therefore, a bigger surface area being covered. Leave None Alive is the easiest to use on said demon heroes, since they're of course wholly within 8 inches of themselves. As a little bonus, I want to show you guys how you can get as many 32mm into combat as possible. Now this is a relatively realistic charge, spreading out like this, however, the core rules state that when piling in, 
you pile in towards the closest model in that unit that you charged. Well, not exactly that part, but it's you. these blood letters have charged these blood reavers. So let me show you exactly what can be done. So let's take a look here at these blood letters here and these blood letters here. So this guy is closer to this blood reaver. However, if I wanna get this guy in first, I have to pile in him in first. So what I can do is the closest blood reaver to, to this blood letter is this blood reaver. So what I can do is I can wrap my base around like this. And that is just slightly under three inches. Then I can wrap this guy around like this. So he is the closest, he's the closest of blood reaver to this blood letter. So what I can do is this. Then he can pile in and go like this. Look at that, he's now within a one inch range. So this guy then piles in here. He's now within a one inch range. There's no way he can get in there, so he'll just pile in towards the closest, which is this guy. He goes here. Then let's go over here. I'll do a top down shot of this once this is done. So then we have this blood letter. Closest blood reaver is this guy. So there's essentially a quarter inch gap from where they are. However, it's still three inches and you have to end your pile and move as close as possible. What's closer than, there's nothing closer than base to base. So you can pile in, let me turn this sword around and of course bump other models from the process. So you can pile in, touch base to base and still wrap yourself around like that. So then this blood letter, his closest model, his closest enemy model is this blood reaver. So he swings over, turning a sword around like that. That causes this guy to come in like this. Then you can have this guy wrap like that. Of course, shift more models because you know these Hellblades are nifty like that. That allows this guy to come in. Let's check the range on that. That is now an inch. So I have these, essentially these five guys here. These five. Not in combat, because I'm gonna pile in this guy now. And then this guy, closest, will go there, there. And that's that, and that's how you pile in as many 32, mil 32 millimeter bases as possible while keeping within coherent unit coherency and using the core rules to your advantage. And here is the top-down shot that I was referring to. It's not exactly easy doing this one-handed, holding this, trying to move models around, so I, I've done the best I could. To finish off looking at the Reapers of Vengeance, we then have the Devour the Craven ability where an extra d3 models flee while they're within three inches of a reapers of vengeance demon unit this is something that can be honestly considered a bonus not something to rely on since there's so many ways around battle shock now but hey when it works it works and it's and as i said it's a nice bonus especially when you're fighting against something like stormcast and you manage to make evil caterers flee in regards to the Blood Lords here, I don't really see the Slaughter Host benefiting the Murder Host Battalion that much. The command ability, first in his sight, really only benefits Flesh Hounds, Demon Heroes, and Blood Crushers. The command trait, however, is incredible on Bloodthirsters, and the Halo of Blood is amazing, absolutely amazing for Tyrants of Blood Lists. But again, this is not for the Murder Host. A Slaughterhorse baseline ability, Slay the Mighty, where Blood Lord Demon units can reroll wound rolls of one when attacking a hero or monster, is nice, but again, amazing with Tyrants of Blood. I'd give Blood Lords a hard pass when building Murder Host lists. Let's take a look at the supporting elements that will really amp this battalion up. The very first unit that should be added in the list to support the murder host is the Blood Secretor. The most important thing that he provides 
is Rage of Corn, adding one extra attack to all friendly corn units wholly within 16 inches of him. This is incredibly important to bloodletters of all kinds, because they have a pitiful one attack with a Hellblade. Heroes, of course, have more. Doubling the attacks makes them worthwhile. Loathsome Sorcery, his other special ability, adds an extra magic, because corn. The second unit that should be added in the list to support the murder host is a Bloodthirster of Unfair Fury. He provides four things. A huge base, which of course is a bigger area for a Locus of Fury and Demon Slaughter Host can't Command abilities. Bloodthirster damage output, which uh, goes without saying. A ranged attack with his Lash, which does a surprising amount of damage and an absolutely incredible command ability, Rejoice in the Slaughter. This makes the murder host deceptively fast and fixes the main issue of large footprint units, such as a sixth man unit of blood crushers not being able to fight. This command ability is so important, instead of talking about it, let me show it. So here we have an almost minimum sized murder host battalion consisting of Skulltaker, two units of Bloodletters, and two units of Flesh Hounds. The Bloodthirster of Unfettered Fury is of course added for this demonstration. On the other side, we have a unit of Blood Warriors, two units of Blood Reavers, and two Slaughter Priests that Korn has deemed unworthy and have sent these demons to let their blood flow. I of course apologize for any incomplete models that are being shown here. As you can see, they are currently being worked on. Let's measure the distance between the two forces. These blood letters are about 16 and a half inches away. Flesh hounds are about the same. These flesh hounds are about the same, are just 16 inches, no, 16 and a half. And the blood letters about 16 inches away. So with, with the murder host, they'll, they'll be able to add two inches to their charge rolls. So moving nine, five inches normally, that's, uh, they require a 10 on their charge and they will require a nine on their charge for the blood letters to be able to make it in combat. The flesh hounds being movement eight, they will require less, a real six. However, there is a way around this which is of course this demonstration. Let's have the demon side move and we will also have them run. So the blood letters, these blood letters here, they will run eight inches, adding two from the murder host. Now let's have these flesh hounds here run, adding two to their run roll, since they are wholly within 16 inches of Skull Taker. They will do three, so that becomes a five. Then let's have these flesh hounds here also run. That becomes an eight for them. And finally, the blood letters right next to them, also adding two. So that becomes a four for them. I will go ahead and move these guys off camera so that way I'm not in the way. So without the murder host here, these demon units would have only been able to run what showed up on their die roll and they would not have been able to get into combat that turn unless there was other abilities where say they, the opponent can pile in with six with, and fight within six. If they, if, they, if they had that capabilities, there's it's a pretty big game. There's tons of abilities out there that I most likely don't know about. But in this specific example here, these demons would have just probably ended up back for a little bit backward. Well, yeah, minus two inches from all this and they would not be able to fight and they would get countercharged by the Bloodbound here and most likely get destroyed since they have very bad armor saves. Now, with the Murder Host, I have been able to run these guys within six inches of the Bloodbound units here. And with Rejoice in the Slaughter, they'll be able to pile in and fight in the combat phase when he uses his command ability. Another thing about Rejoice in the Slaughter because the Bloodbound have no enemy units within three inches of them during the combat phase, assuming nothing, nothing changes here, 
the Bloodbound player cannot fight. So the player with Rejoice in the Slaughter is capable of dictating which of his units are attacked and which ones he can attack with. This is an incredibly powerful play to have in your back pocket. And you can force your opponent to attack things you don't want him to attack, say Flesh Hounds. And finally, the third support unit that should be added in the list to support the Mortal Host Battalion is a pair of Slaughter Priests. Slaughter Priests are staples for all corn lists, and rightly so. They can do a blood blessing prayer when part of the corn allegiance, and honestly, when are you not doing that? One of their war scroll prayers in a judgment of corn, all in the same hero phase. They have so much utility that I start all of my lists, demon or mortal, with two slaughter priests. For the murder host, the best blood blessings to take are Killing Frenzy and Bronze Flesh. Killing Frenzy is pretty basic. Plus one to hit for both ranged and melee weapons. I mention ranged weapons because the Wrath of Corn Bloodthirster and Bloodthirster of Unfettered Fury both have worthwhile ranged weapons that do an incredible amount of damage. And they reroll their own ones to hit thanks to Locus of Fury. That's right, Locus of Fury work, does work on ranged weapons too. Since we're on the topic of Slaughter Priests, the judgments of corn that I constantly use and consider stables are the Wrath Axe and the Hex Quarter Skulls. This is because of the utility they provide. The Hex Gorger Skulls are one of the best anti-magic capabilities that we have. Being only 40 points, they do far, far more than their cost. The War Scroll speaks for itself, but what isn't completely obvious is just how far up they can affect the table in the early game. Let me show you. So here I am using the deployment from the battle plan Star Strike from General's Handbook 2019. The player territory is half the table this way, so it is 24 inches. Now you have to deploy 12 inches away from your opponent's territory, so ergo our actual deployment zone is 12 inches. I place the skull altar here that way I can have the Slaughter Priests, Priest or Priest, depending on how many you have in your list, or again, I recommend two, can start the game affected by the Skull Altar. And the Skull Altar is quite crucial when it comes to judgments because it allows all judgments to be re-rollable. So the Slaughter Priest is at the top of his deployment zone of 12 inches and in his hero phase, he's going to attempt to bring out the Hex Scorger Skull's Judgment. They require a 3 on the Judgment roll on a single d6 in order to, for the Judgment to succeed. So he rolls exactly a 3. They are then placed wholly within 8 inches of him. Or any priest, in that matter. Corn Priest. That includes the Chaos War Shrine. So they are placed holy with an eight of him and they have a six inch coherency they are now 20 inches up the table they then move an extra eight inches and can fly So they are at the 28, almost the 28 inch mark of the table. And then they affect 12 inches on top of that. So they are nearly touching the enemy deployment zone at the start of the game. That is crucial. With the Hex Gorger Skulls capable of being thrown out so far up in the first turn of the game, with their minus two to casting rolls that affect any wizard, this is what keeps corn in the game against magic heavy armies. 
It's not just unbinds. Unbinds you have to beat the roll of the casting roll. And when enemy wizards have pluses, that makes unbinds so much more difficult. And in regards to unbinds, we have tons of them. Slaughter Priests have them, Flesh Hounds have them, Karanak has one, the Wrath of Corn Bloodthirster has one and a plus two. And with the Mage Eater Command trait, we can give him a second one or on any other general they can unbind. We have plenty of options of being able to unbind. And we have unbinds on demand if so needed by summoning in five Flesh Hounds with three Blood Tithe on the summoning table. The next thing that Hex Gorger Skulls do is that when an enemy wizard is within 12 inches of both Hex Gorger Skull models and they roll an unmodified casting roll of an eight, they forget that spell. That spell is not successful. And every wizard takes d6 mortal wounds while they're within 12 inches of a Hex Gorger Skull model. Because this is extremely specific and required by requiring an unmodified eight for a casting roll, I consider this rule to be a bonus. And I don't plan for it, since it's, again, such a, such a heavy condition. So putting all this together, what does a sample murder host list look like? Let's take a look. Here's what I would take to build a murder host list. Starting, of course, with the murder host itself, Skull Taker, two units of 10 blood letters, and two units of five flesh hounds. Next is a blood secretor, a blood thirster of unfettered fury, two slaughter priests, the hex scourger skulls, wrath axe, and a skull altar, a bloodthirster of insensate rage, five wrathmongers, and a flesh hound I really need to get to painting, Karanak, because I keep talking about him. This list comes out to 1,940 points, but I always buy the extra command point, so the list will be at 1,990 points. The list will be from the realm of Gur. That way, the bloodthirster of insensate rage will have the artifact the Amberglaive. The mandatory artifact from the Reapers of Vengeance Slaughter Host, the Skull Shard Mantle, will be on the Blood Secrator. Now I know what you may be thinking right now. Why so many mortals in what's supposed to be a demon-focused list? That's because mortals bring all the buffs, to be completely blunt. I've heard the opinions that demons shouldn't have to take mortals and should be able to stand alone. I'm not going to go that down that rabbit hole. This is simply the options that the battle tournament presents. Blood letters are also really sad when they have a single attack apiece. And I brought along the two sources of bonus attacks, which affect demons in the book. And that's the Murder Host Battalion. Tune in next time on Storm of Blood, where we'll be looking at the General's Handbook 2019 and the changes to the pitched battle battle plans. These changes make Korn a whole lot more capable of capturing objectives. If you like this video, give it a big thumbs up. If you didn't, tell me why so that way Karanak is not sent after me. Subscribe and hit that notification bell so that way you don't miss a single video. And see you on the battlefield.